This is your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 89. Welcome to your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Well, welcome back. I am so happy to be here today with you. It is a crazy rainy day here in California, which happens so rarely, but I just sort of wanted to share that again with you because I know I always want to try to get you guys to come back to the present. So I want you to sort of check in and ask yourself, what do I hear and what do I see and what's really happening right now? And, you know, you can probably hear my voice, but what do you see and what do you smell? What do you taste? Come really, really present with the moment as we get started in honoring your mental health, because that's what we're here for, right? Plus, we're here to have a little party, but <laughs> we're mostly here for mental health. <laughs> we're here for mental wellness. We're here for mental support. And if that's why you're here, welcome. You're in the right place. This is where we join forces and we hold hands with other brave human beings like yourself And we support each other as we do really, really hard things together. So today's podcast is a little spin. I was just sitting here thinking, you know, what do I want to talk about? And I have a few really, really great interviews I want to share with you. But I felt really called to speak with you about what we're talking about today, which is the five biggest mistakes I see people making when they're managing their anxiety. So these are the things I often catch my clients doing. Sometimes I catch myself doing, shh, don't tell anybody, it's, but it's true. <laughs> I think that we catch it, but we all get caught in doing, making these mistakes. And so what I wanted to do was put it together into one podcast so that you can come back at any point and do a check-in and ask yourself, What are some of the mistakes I might be making? Where can I make some changes? What do I need to prioritize in order for me to manage my anxiety better? Okay, so let's just get into it, shall we? Because that's why you're here and that's why I'm here and I am super ready to go. Okay, so let's just do it. The five biggest mistakes we make when we make managing anxiety. Number one. This is a big one, but I'm going to say that every single time. So you guys are just going to have to get used to that. Number one, and this is a huge mistake I see also other therapists making when they're managing anxiety with their clients, is they spend way too much time trying to figure out or solve why. Why do I have anxiety? Why? Right? And we go over and over, we spend hours and we put ourselves through the ringer going over why, why do I have anxiety, right? Now, I'm going to always say there is a time and a place for addressing the why. I'm not completely against it. But what I'm talking about here is spending too much time focusing on the why. Why is this happening to me? Why do I have this problem? Why do I have anxiety or these thoughts, right? And often what happens is they review, is it something I ate? Was it my childhood? Is it my genetics? Who triggered this anxiety? Is there some unconscious meaning to all of this anxiety? What does it mean that I have this thought, right, compared to that thought? Those people over there, they're fine because They just have thoughts about contamination, but I have these intrusive sexual thoughts or I have thoughts about health anxiety. And so there's got to be something wrong with me, right? That's sort of the language I hear a lot or vice versa. Again, it doesn't matter what the subtype is, 
most of the time, people would love to have other people's form of anxiety, thinking that that would be easier. But here's the thing, it's not. Pain is pain. Suffering is suffering. And if we're having anxiety, it's pretty hard, right? So number one, the first big mistake I see people making when managing anxiety is looking at the why, right? Too much. And if you're doing that, what I'm going to encourage you to do is just swing on back to the present. Be really here in the place where you're experiencing anxiety. Make a safe place for your anxiety to exist as it rises and falls and just does what it does. Because the truth is, sometimes it just comes and goes for no reason. You know, we could spend hours again trying to figure it out, but the truth is, There are so many factors that make us vulnerable to anxiety, and sometimes it just shows up to the party uninvited. (laughs) And like I said, it is a mental health party, and anxiety often comes along. We know that, right? So that's number one. Okay, everyone good on that one? Right? Take a mental note if that's something you do. I don't want you to beat yourself up for this. I don't want you to now go and ruminate on why you ruminate on the why, because that's not going to help again. We just want to take notes and we want to say, okay, that's some area that I could do some work on. Doesn't make me a bad person. I'm just going to take note of that and work on that. Okay. Number two. Oh man, I have to say, this is one I see all the time in my office, which is this. The second biggest mistake we make when managing anxiety is that we spend too much time reading about how to fix our fear or sadness or, you know, panic or depression, whatever the mental health problem is. It could be other areas of your life too, but you spend all this time reading about it instead of actually practicing the tools, right? I can't tell you how many times I've had People come to my office for the assessment and they could list off on their fingers all the books they've read about their mental health struggles. And hey, I love those clients because they're the clients who are ready to do the work. They're willing to lean in. They're not ashamed to look at their problems. I have nothing against doing education. But if you're spending a lot of time reading and there's no ratio of you applying the tools that you learn in the reading, well, then the reading really doesn't help, right? The truth is, how do you ride a bike? Well, I could say you get on the bike and you push the pedals, but you might say, but how? How do I push the pedals with my hands and my feet? And I'll go, no, no, with your feet. And you'll go, well, which foot goes on which pedal? Do I sit backwards? Do I sit forwards? What do I do? So yes, it is important to get the details, but the truth is until you actually sit on the bike, you actually still don't know how to ride a bike, right? You could learn about it, but until you actually practice it, you're not learning the actual application of these things. And I get it. If you're someone who reads a ton, again, I don't want you to feel bad about that. But what I do want to bring you to is It can be a mistake we make in our long-term recovery. I hope I'm not being too harsh here, but I really want to be very clear in a very compassionate way so you feel empowered to catch this stuff and make changes because that's what we're here for. We're here to make changes, to learn, and then go out and live our best life. But we only live our best life by applying what we've learned. Here's another piece. You also only get to live our best life if you take note from the mistakes that we made. And that is learning. You know, I'm sure a ton of you may or may not have perfectionism, but this is the thing about perfectionism is the learning happens through the mistakes. We make these mistakes and then we learn. And that's the best part, right? So I digress just a little bit there, but I had to mention that point. Okay, so the number two biggest mistake we make when we're managing anxiety is that we spend too much time reading instead of applying the tools that we've learnt. 
right? Now that also goes for podcasts you've listened to, documentaries you've watched, seminars you've been to, therapists that you've seen. The truth is, and I say to my clients, if you come to me once a week, that's awesome. You are putting in brave work. But if that's really all you do, I can't really help you that much, right? The real work is the other 23 hours of that day and the other six days of the week that that person goes home and practices and applies and falls on their face and then picks themselves up and brushes themselves off and comes back and tries again, right? So it's all about the application of the tools. Okay. Here we go. Let's move on to number three, the number three biggest mistakes we make when managing anxiety that I see is this one. And I've already mentioned it twice, but I made it a point because it's important. We spend too much time beating ourselves up for the fact that we have anxiety or another mental health issue that we never signed up for. You never signed up for anxiety, right? It's horrible. It's really, really hard. We, we, you know, no one would want to have anxiety, right? What we do is when we have it, we spend a bunch of time trying to figure out why. Then we spend a bunch of time reading about it or not. And then we beat ourselves up because we're still not better yet. And we say horrible things like, oh, you're a terrible person or you're weak or you're just such a loser, or I can't handle this. And we just are so mean to ourselves for experiencing something that's already painful. The suffering's already there. It's already hard. Our work isn't to make it worse. Our work is to make it better and easier and doable and manageable and figure outable, right? That's a word. (laughs) I've decided it's a word. But when we beat ourselves up for something we never signed up for, we start to feel hopeless and we start to feel worthless. And those are the three themes that lead us to depression. Now, the truth is, statistics show us that a large majority of people who have an anxiety disorder also have depression. So if that's you, please put your hand on your heart right now because you're not alone and that's not your fault either, right? And you're not to beat yourself up for having two things going on because you never signed up for that either, right? And so again, that's the third big mistake I see people make is they beat themselves up. Now, I know I've talked a lot about this recently in recent podcasts, but self-compassion is your tool. Go back. Listen to the podcast with Kristen Neff and go back to listen to all the other podcasts we have on self-compassion, any resources you might find. But here's the thing. Let's go back to number two. Once you've read a little bit or you've learned a little bit, the ratio has to be even. You have to spend at least one-to-one ratio of time reading about compassion and practicing compassion. Now, let's actually tweak that a little bit. A one-to-one ratio is good, but it's not great. (laughs) What I'd love to see is a ratio of one to five. So one part is reading, learning, and five is practicing and applying of self-compassion. Deal? Can I make you a deal right now? Let's let's make a deal, okay? So you're going to make a deal with me that you're going to do a one-to-five ratio of learning to doing. Deal? Yes, I hear you. Let's do it. All right. (laughs) All right, let's move on. The number four biggest mistake I see people making when managing anxiety, and this is a big one. Oh man, this one might hurt a tiny bit. P.S. I do this too, and I've gotten so much better at it. When you do, your life will change, I promise you, is this. We go to other people to make our anxiety go away. That's the number four. The fourth biggest mistake 
I see people make with anxiety is that they feel anxiety and they jump up and they run to the person who they love, who supports them, who's there for them. And they try to find a way to make that person take their anxiety away for them. Maybe they ask for reassurance, right? Are you sure? It might sound a little bit like this, like, are you sure this won't happen? Do you think it could happen? What would I do if it happened? Promise me it wouldn't happen. Promise me you'll be there. We do a ton of reassurance seeking. Sometimes we're even really tricky about getting it without them knowing. (laughs) It's like, shh, nobody knows, but I'm really tricky, right? Another way you do it is you go to them and you verbally vomit. Now that's not a clinical term, but let's just go with it. You verbally just explode all of your fear onto your loved one or your family member or somebody, and you just lay it on them and you walk away sort of feeling better and they walk away feeling dumped on right? And I'm not saying you do this intentionally. I get it. Like I said, this used to be one of my really big mistakes. I had to work so hard on not doing this, right? It just became natural. I didn't even know I was doing it, right? Until my loved one said, listen, this is getting really tough. And this is where it does get tough. After we do this for a while, our loved one supports us, but at some point they start to feel the weight of it and then they start to react in an irritable way or they're not compassionate or they're kind of cruel and rude and then you feel so hurt because the person you love that you need so much that you want to be help you, that you lean on, isn't now being kind to you, Right? And a piece of that is because it's not their fault and it's not your fault. It's just that everybody's tired, right? That's what anxiety does. But we have to work at not displacing our anxiety onto other people or things, right? Does that make sense? It's harsh. Like I know it's hard and I know part of you might be feeling like, wow, Kimberly, lay off, like you're being tough. And I know that it might sound that way. But again, my hope with this episode is to really bring to light the biggest mistakes we make. Not not that you're wrong, not that there's anything wrong with you. But the reason I say biggest is that they have the biggest impact on the quality of our life. Now, the truth is, what are we doing all this for, right? We're doing it for love, we in this life because of the people we love, the pets we love, the things we love to do, right? And we have to make sure and protect those loved ones so that they don't get taken over by fear too. Fear is a very sneaky thing, right? Anxiety can, if we're not careful, spread over and take over our life, right? And that's why we're here. I know you brave people and lovely souls are here to make sure that doesn't happen to you. And so again, what we want to do when we talk about this is I know it's hard, but we want to protect our loved ones from that. We don't want to shower our loved ones with fear as well, right? And so this is a really important one. Do a little check-in, maybe even check in with them and ask them, like, do you feel like I do that with you, you know, and have a code word, right? It's sometimes it's really helpful to have a code word with your family member so that sometimes when you don't even know that you're doing this, they might gently put their hand on your arm and say, honey, fire truck. (laughs) And if fire truck is the code word for, you're verbally vomiting anxiety all over me, well, then you feel safe and you don't feel yelled at. You don't feel judged. You don't feel criticized. You have communicated with each other that something's going on, right? And that you might want to do a little check-in and they might even say, I often tell my clients to say, honey, I love you. What is it that you need so that we can both work at not letting this fear take over? And that's a piece, right? So it's making sure that you and your loved one join forces, not that fear joins forces against somebody else, if that makes any sense at all. Okay, hard one, 
but really an important one. Go gentle, go easy, go compassionate here because I'm cruising through these at a rapid, rapid pace. I'm not giving much time at all to process it for you. And so I really want you just to go gentle here. Okay, so let's just take a pause. Do some breathing. Okay, deep breath in. And breathe out. Put your hand on your heart. Send yourself big love. Big, big fat love. Virtual hugs coming from me, right? And then we're going to ease into the number five. The fifth biggest mistake I see people make when managing anxiety is running. Running away from fear, right? Now, this is where I say the thing I say in almost every podcast, which is it's a beautiful day to do hard things or one hard thing. It doesn't have to be plural, right? Every day is a day where we can stare fear down because running away from fear, all that that does is teach you, number one, that you can't handle it. Number two, fear wins always. And number three, the thing you're running away must be dangerous. And oftentimes, the thing we're running away from isn't in fact dangerous. It's just that we had thoughts that they were dangerous. And we interpreted the thought that it was dangerous with this idea that it must be a fact that it's dangerous. And that's not true. So we have to lean in and face our fear. We can't keep running. And when I say that, what I'm not saying is that you must face all of your fears today because that's unreasonable and not even that safe, to be honest. You want to do this gradually and gently and give yourself time to process and recalibrate between. So I'm not saying do it all at once. I'm saying readjust the way you look at fear to a place where you now are absolutely committing to leaning in, staring into the face of fear, right? Doing the hard thing, right? Staying, just staying. The truth is here, let me tell you something. I always talk about staring fear in the face, and that's pretty aggressive, right? If you're able to stare your fear in the face, that's willingness 100%. Let's say you're not at a 10 out of 10 willingness. Let's say you're at a 6, right? It might be that you don't stare your fear in the face. It might be that you just stay in the presence of it, right? We don't have to win any records. We're not here to win an award. This is not a race. Sometimes we just have to stay and be with the fear. Hang in there. Ride the wave as the fear goes and comes, right? So you don't have to stare it down. Now let me share with you. The reason I say stare it in the face is because I really value empowerment. I want you to feel empowered. I want you to use that language and narrative where it's like, I am going to take you down, fear. You're going down, <laughs> right? And if that helps you, I really want to empower you and use that language. But if you're not there and you're not feeling empowered at all and you're just wanting to take steps, just hang out, wait for it, stay with it. But the main thing is, is that we don't run, right? Okay. So here it is. Let's go through it again. The first biggest mistake we make when managing anxiety is that we spend too much time trying to solve the why. The second big mistake I think people make and I see often is that we spend too much time reading about how to fix it instead of practicing and applying the tools. The third biggest mistake we make is that we beat ourselves up way too much. So if you're doing that right now, please don't. Please be gentle. Number four, we go to others to make our anxiety go away instead of us managing it ourselves and going through the steps ourselves. And number five, we run we run away. So the solution to all this is practice B 
being with fear, right? It really almost checks off all of those lists that we've gone through. Practice being with fear and holding a gentle space for fear to exist, right? Fear can't hurt you. If you open your palms and you open your heart and you let love just shine in on you, right? You can do it. You can let this fear come and rise and fall within you, right? So that is the five biggest mistakes I see people make when managing anxiety. You are not alone. Let's just come back to one of the common main pieces of self-compassion, which is common humanity, right? We're all in this together. We all make these mistakes that that's the truth, myself included, right? And you know, that's the truth. I am human. We're all human. So hold hands with your loved ones, hold hands with your heart, hold hands with the community here, metaphorically, and know that we are all here together supporting you. You're not alone and that we can, we can do hard things. Okay. So thank you. I am so, so thrilled to have this time with you. Really, really, I am. You guys, I didn't do the I did a hard thing challenge today because I want to direct you to the Facebook group. I know I keep mentioning it, but we did a scholarship where we had people post in the Facebook group and Instagram the hard things that they've been doing. And you guys blew me away, right? Blew me away. Oh my gosh, the pictures and the videos and the stories blew me away. You guys are hardcore. The bravery, the braveometer, is that what I I call it? The (laughs) braveometer. The bravery meter or the braveometer (laughs) was blown off the charts, right? So massive braveometer explosion going on with that. So I haven't done a I did a hard thing segment in today because I really urge you, if you are looking for some inspiration of other people like you who are trying their hardest to lean into fear, go on over and check it out. It's a private group. You will have to ask to join, but I will be checking often to let people in. Check it out. It's badass, I have to say. (laughs) Okay, so have a lovely day. I love you guys. I will be talking with you in the next week, bringing you amazing interviews that I have already done and I'm so excited to share with you. So have a great day. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.